Okay, I'm going to switch to English again uh, because of our distinguished guests. Um, now, um, in 1987, there was a team of Japanese scientists from Osaka University who were trying to sequence the genome of a very well-known bacte bacteria called E. coli. Uh, now, what they found during their research was a DNA sequence for which they concluded that, at this point, they have no idea what to do with it. Uh, their actual conclusion within the paper was that the biological significance of these sequences is not yet known. Now, unbeknownst to these researchers, what they have actually done is they uncovered the mechanism that will start a revolution in the biological sciences. And together with uh, some other discoveries or, or, or projects that we are working in can actually have a significant impact on our civilization and on us as a species in, ge in general. Um, now, if every, as every new technology, CRISPR, uh, can have a significant effect on us and we are not sure whether we are ready for this technology. So there are a whole bunch of uh, you know, additional uh, scientific, ethical and political questions that, um, that we have to raise. And now here to discuss these matters with me, um, we have Jonathan Littet, uh, who uh, is a lecturer in genetics and uh, medical institute of, uh, in, within the University of Aberdeen. Uh, he's also a stand-up comedian. Um, <laughs> Sitting down comedian now. <laughs> yes, yeah, so sorry, I didn't warn you about that. I'm going to share some of the secrets <laughs> during the conversation. Uh, we also have uh, Boris Kirov. Uh, he's a, a PhD uh, in uh, synthetic, uh, synthetic biology, uh, and he's currently teaching in the Technical University of Sofia. Uh, he likes to ski. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, lastly, we, uh, we have uh, uh, Christo Kutiev, who is uh, uh, an expert in, in bioethics, and he's a board member of the Institute of Public Policy. So, um, please welcome our panel. <clears throat> All right, now, gentlemen, I, I, I did begin um, this conversation with my introduction with a the, with the short story uh, about a team of researchers who uncovered something that they had no idea what it actually was. So um, I would like to start off with, uh, with um, actually asking you, John, uh, what mm -hmm. is it that they actually found? Well, as you said, they didn't really know what it was that they found. And um, over the, the subsequent years, multiple researchers found much the same thing. So this seemed to be a feature of bacterial genomes, not just bacteria, but archaea, which are kind of bacteria, but you're not allowed to call them bacteria anymore. Um, they're prokaryotes. So. Um, and I guess the, foc the research focus was on well, trying to understand, well, these must be important because they're in lots of different bacteria. What is it that they're doing? Um, and I, I, as a, just as an aside, this is, a, if you like, a great example of the importance of the serendipity of basic research. Okay, you, you, it would be very hard to go out if you said, well, I'm going to invent an entirely new genome editing tool. Um, I doubt you would have uncovered it in this way. So it's the serendipitous discovery of these uh, repetitive structures which drove the research effort to try and understand it. And the people doing that work were driven to try and understand the bacteria. Right. And what they found was that th this was effectively a, an immune system for bacteria. So bacteria, like all other uh, cellular life, are infected by viruses. And those viruses... Um, go into the, they inject their DNA into the bacteria, and if the bacteria can have some way of recognizing that DNA and then destroying it, chopping it up in this case, then that would increase the, the, the survival of that species as a whole. And that's essentially what these things are. So what it looks like the bacteria do is, if they survive a bacterial infection, they've of a viral infection, they've sampled a bit of the virus DNA and they've squirreled it away so that in future, if they see that, that virus again, they've got a copy of it, if you like, so they can say, aha, I've seen that before. And then they can take that, that little copy and use it as a template. They attach it to an enzyme, which is sort of, it can go in and chew up the DNA based on that guide. So they're not going to chew up any other DNA, which is their own DNA. They just target specifically the DNA of the virus. So essentially that's what they discovered, that they, they've got an immune system which is sequence specific, so it's incredibly specific, and it targets an enzyme which, which cuts the DNA. 
and that's, that's the end of it then for the virus. Right, so one of the uh, more useful analogies that um, maybe you know, many of the people here heard is that uh, we are essentially talking about molecular scissors, so we can cut right. out sections of DNA and replace it with whatever we, s whatever we want to um, replace it with. Yeah, the key innovation is the ability to make a targeted cut anywhere that we want within the DNA of an organism. Okay. So um, uh, you were both um, uh, in involved, you know, th these are fairly recent um, discoveries that have been made, um, um, especially uh, speaking about the applications of these technologies in prokaryotic organisms. So it was in the 2012-13, um, uh, am, am, am I mistaken? Well, 2012 was when people fixed upon the idea of saying, okay, it works in bacteria. Does it work in yeah. eukaryotes, which is right. <coughs> us, plants, fungi? Yeah, well, not ju not just humans, obviously zebras as well and things like that. Right. But, yeah. um, so what was uh, what was the the effect on your field? Now, now, Boris, you are um, in, within the field of synthetic biology, meaning that you are manipulating organisms to create new ones or to change them. Yeah. So what happened in your field? Uh, basically, it made everything possible or anything possible. All right, uh, because before the CRISPR system, uh, when we wanted to target a specific gene or we wanted to create a new site for some kind of regulation, etc. We need to create a whole system specifically dedicated to this site, all right? So it was like developing a new enzyme for every experiment you wanted to do. And then it took years and years to make the enzyme or enzyme system, you know, with some additions. And then it took another couple of years to realize that, okay, we made a mistake. We do not want to target it that way or in that place, all right? It's like, imagine if you're writing, you have to write an article for the Royal Society of Chemistry, all right? Okay, then you write it, and your word by definition is, you know, like the American spelling, okay? And then at a certain point you realize, all right, fuck, I have to submit it to England, you know, it's like, right. it doesn't work like that, so I have to change, you know, all the words, like, I have to change all the ERs to REs, etc., etc., etc. And then, okay, it was like before the CRISPR, you had to write a special software for each word you wanted to change, all right? So the software goes and changes the word, and then if the software reads another word as the word you were aiming also for, it was changing also that one. Then after CRISPR, you had like the word find and replace thingy, all right? You just write the sequence you want to, it finds specifically that sequence, and then it changes it very fast to whatever you want to. Okay. So we're not talking about a significant change in, in the general principle. We knew how to change the DNA of organisms before, but what we now have is that we can do it much more precisely and much quicker. Yeah, and but cheaper. before it, and yeah, cheaper. but before it wasn't working actually. I mean, very few <laughs> things worked, and right. then afterwards it worked. So before we were dreaming, and now we were actually doing it. Okay, that's the big difference. Right. Uh, during the discussion, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to make a make, make a small uh, remark here uh, to remind you that you can uh, submit your questions in sli.do uh, uh, with hashtag ra ratio bg, um, and um, you know I'll be reviewing the questions during the discussion, and I can I can ask them to. Uh, to our panel. Um, okay, uh, so um, what are the, 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 the major applications that we are talking about here? Because, I mean, when we speak about CRISPR, there is a lot of media out there, you know, there is uh, you know, enormous proclamations, you know, here we go, we can change everything now. Uh, but at this current state of the technology, where do we stand right now in terms of applications? What can we do with this right now? So, in terms of basic biological research, it means that you now have a tool that can allow you to make virtually any changes that you want in the genome of an organism that you're interested in. So, it's used a lot in basic biological research. We use it in my laboratory for that purpose. So, because, so if we want to go in and remove a gene, then we can. It's very easy to develop, to make a little uh, tag, which will send the enzyme to that gene. The, the enzyme will cut in the gene, and usually what happens is that, that cut will be recognized very rapidly by the cell. The cell, so eukaryotic cells are very efficient at getting rid of these breaks, what we call double-strand breaks, because they're, they're, they're a catastrophe for the cell. Now, they, there's two ways in which they can do that. Uh, the, the, the fastest and most common way is something called non-homologous end joining. It's an awful term. But what it literally means is like, quick, now, fix it! Um, and so what the cell does, it doesn't really care about how it fixes it, and it makes errors when it does it. It just joins the break back together. Okay? Right. And that usually then damages the gene in such a way that the gene is gone, it's functionally gone. But we can also uh, 
provide the cell with, a, with the thing that we want to introduce. We can give it a bit of, a bit of DNA um, and that matches the break that we've introduced, but it's got extra bits that we want to introduce. Okay, right. So say an extra gene or something. And then what happens is the cell will copy that bit to repair it and you'll have inserted in that, in that place the thing that you want to insert. So we use that a lot right. uh, in, in sort of basic biological research. Right. Obviously, the next step, of course, is, and it's where we are now, is, well, okay, can we use this then in therapeutics in humans? To cure certain diseases? To cure diseases is probably the first thing that people think about, uh, but obviously the thing that is lurking in the background is to make ourselves better, right? right. So, so there's, there's, there's making ourselves, um, curing ourselves of a genetic disease, but then is it, oh, could we, could we improve people, like, if we can do this? Right. Okay, well, well, if, if, if one decides to, to, to follow the public discourse around in CRISPR, what, what they will often notice is that uh, uh, the same way that this panel is actually structured is that you have a few scientists and then you have uh, people who are dealing with public policy and law. Um, now, uh, why, why do we need a lawyer on the panel? Well, exactly. Neither scientists, after inventing something, says, oh, I have invented something and it uh, generally meets the legal obligations and uh, it is uh, legally uh, compliable. So uh, when you are an inventor or a scientist, your, uh, your job, your mission is uh, to, to make science, to invent something, to discover something. And um, you rarely think about the side effects. So. Um, the role of the law is uh, to generate the public opinion and to foresee what would happen and what will be the risks. So, uh, speaking about law and ethics, we have to measure are the risks lower than the benefits. And that's why we need a lawyer, as the basic aim of law is to protect the public, to protect the society. And when one makes a discovery, we have to see is it compatible and we will preserve the future generations. That's right. the main rule. So when we speak about regulation, we currently have extensive regulation concern, uh, uh, concerning GMO um, organisms, um, at least on a European and a global level, locally certainly for, uh, for, for, for many countries. Isn't this law uh, applicable uh, when we speak about CRISPR and what is, what, is, what is the difference? Why do we need new regulation when it comes to this, this Generally technology? Generally, it's between the... Uh, the problem is uh, <coughs> in the difference between uh, being uh, genetically edited and being genetically modified. For, for example, somebody makes uh, the difference uh, in the field between uh, an error and a mistake. Uh, so, um, if I misspell Mr. Pettit's name with uh, four, four T's, uh, it's correct. <laughs> if I spell it with three, it's an error. But if instead of spelling it uh, Pettit, I spell it Pity. That's a mistake. Right. And <laughs> the idea is that uh, the impact of gene editing uh, could be um, close to the impact of gene modifying or a part of it. And the legislators are currently uh, confused. So are we going to apply the GMO legislation over the gene editing or we have something new? And if we are making uh, specific legislation, particularly for gene editing, are, aren't we going to a certain legal spiral? that uh, will uh, insist on us uh, for applying a different law and a, dif and a, dif and a different uh, regulation for each new invention in the field of gene editing. Right. That's the main problem. No, 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 from, from, from the point of view of, uh, of scientists, you know, many people assume uh, that you, know, you just do your research and you are uh, you know, borderline mad, you know, most of you, and you just want to <laughs> see the, uh, oh, the yeah. end result. <laughs> uh, but uh, I am sure that you have, uh, you know, within, within the, uh, your own field, you have some sort of a, a regulation of what you can actually experiment with. Right. The, the most countries have regulations that uh, operate it through the academic research, that's true, and uh, each research institute will have to have its own regulatory system as well. Um, CRISPR is an interesting one because once researchers realise okay. the actual power of this, a number of prominent scientists came forward and wrote articles in the scientific journal saying, look, maybe we should hold off for a while while we look at the risks. Um, yeah, and I think that was that was spawned by. I mean, we could, we may be talking about gene drives, but the the technology, which is kind of a, a, a viral version, if you like, of um, of CRISPR, the gene drive technology. Somebody developed that using fruit flies, um, 
And when they were interrogated after the fact, it's like, what precautions did you take to make sure these flies didn't escape? They said, it's okay, they were in, in one, the flies were inside one Tupperware box, which was inside another box. <laughs> okay, that doesn't sound like it's probably good enough, but right. So, I mean, I think that's the reason for being, why you would probably want to be cautious and say, well, look, are we dealing with something here right. that could get out of control? And in fact, there's, there's a precedence for this. In the 1970s, this is again another thing that came from bacteria, restriction enzymes. These are the enzymes which were critical for cloning. So the outcome for this were, was the ability to make human insulin in bacteria, for instance. Um, the, the scientists that developed that technology suddenly thought, wait, wait, we, and they, they talked about a moratorium on this. So, right. you know, to be fair to scientists, we can sometimes be responsible and moral. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the short thing to say is that, I mean, the more regulation you put, you're regulating the ones that abide with the law. The ones that do not intend to abide to the law, they don't care what regulations you put anyway. Right. So the crazy scientists are going to remain crazy no matter what laws are go you're going to put. And when you put more regulations, you're just blocking the work of the proper scientists, actually. Right. I mean, th there is this way of thinking also. Because right now, in order to maintain a GMO, just to maintain it, not to, you know, not to work with it in Bulgaria, you have to register yourself at the Ministry of Agriculture. All right? I mean, and then you have to pay a substantial amount of money for our research institutes. Um, it's not really promoting development of science in Bulgaria. That yeah, kind it's, of slowing down, it's slowing down research. Um, um, I, I just want to take a step back here and, and speak about the applications um, again. When we are addressing, you know, as you said, we have to find the proper balance of you know, what the benefits are and what Most. the dangers are. So um, can you give us a, a, a few examples about the current or something that you imagine in the future that we can do with organisms that can help us substantially as a society? Now set aside you know, me the medical field. Uh, but, uh, you know, developing certain types of bacteria or crops that we can... Yeah, I mean, actually, a huge amount of work is being done right now in China because they don't care about regulation. <laughs> All right. China. And actually, they work a lot on crops. Like, there are, like, hundreds of papers every month coming out of Chinese institutions regarding changing rice, changing tomato, changing this, changing that. Okay, that's the obvious thing. Improving the shelf life, you know, the, the length of shelf life of anything that we eat. All right? Um, improving the quality of whatever it is, the quantity also, I mean, it's, you know, having bigger uh, tomatoes, you know, like, uh, I read recently about work on having more sugar in oranges. All right, it might, yeah. No, no, the, the, these are fundamentally safe, right? I mean, we are essentially speaking about uh, uh, GMO products, which we have at least some proof that in plants, uh, it's fairly, it's relatively safe. Uh, but can it have an effect on, 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 on the ec ecosystem, you know, in a certain yeah, way sure, if it's not control? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you think of it a bit, you know, I'm, I'm changing the perspective a bit philosophically, but okay. all right, if we think about the, you know, this immune system bacteria have, basically, you know, they want to get rid of foreign, yeah, and possibly dangerous DNA, yeah, that's inside the bacterial cell, yeah? So imagine that you, if you can reprogram the whole system that you make it in such a way that some kind of bacterium regards its own DNA as potentially dangerous as long as bacterium is not a super bug, it, it doesn't grow super fast, etc. So you just, you make a self-accelerating system that's pushing forward the mutation, you know, only towards accelerating, accelerating the growth of some bacterium. Right. It could conquer the whole world, I mean. So, let's speak it clear. The society uh, is concerned about are we going to have designer babies and are we going to resurrect dinosaurs? <laughs> so uh, as, as usually, <coughs> as, as usual, we are concerned with the wrong questions. You know, of when course, we're speaking of course, about of course. technology. And uh, um, in that point of view, we have three aspects which we have to think about. As law is already outrun by the uh, progress, the scientific progress, and of course we cannot stop progress. What Boris said before. Um, three minutes is uh, that uh, somehow we, we will put brakes on the scientific uh, speed. Mm -hmm. It's not quite that. Uh, you can't stop progress, right? But uh, you can make it safer and you can protect the society. So uh, CRISPR was officially introduced and known to the wide pro public in 2014 and in 2016 we have embryo experiments with embryos which are less than 12 days. They were course. in China as well, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. And from 2014 to 2016, we had just two years. 
and how long and how far are we from actual exper uh, experiments clinically tested on humans? So, can I, yeah, can I just interject here as of well? Course. I mean, the UK now, the UK Embryology Authority uh, last year gave the go-ahead for those experiments within the UK. Okay, so to test it in embryos. To, to be tested in human embryos. The proviso is that those embryos must not be taken to term. So in other words, they remain uh, in a Petri dish. They will okay. never become a human. They'll never be implanted, yes, that's right. Right, but, but you can oh. use these tests uh, to, to prove a principle. Uh, we can. The, 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 yeah, the, the, the idea is that it gives you access to, to studying the effects of uh, gene functions. It's, again, it's kind of basic biology, but on the border with applied biology, I suppose. Yeah. Right. So currently the focus is, um, 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 as we said, is, 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 is to really understand how this technology works, right? We are not at a stage in which we actually know what it can do. Uh, or we are, uh, I mean, how, how fair are the assumptions that we're making here? We, well, we have a good understanding of the mechanisms involved, uh, sufficiently so that we can, that people have already modified the enzyme itself to change its properties. Okay. Um, um, it's more the concern, all biological systems are inherently noisy. So although you may understand the unit, the enzyme, uh, and you may understand its behavior in a simple system, Putting it into a human cell, that's no longer in a simple system. It's in a really, really complex system that's um, far from equilibrium. And uh, we all know that all human, no enzyme, no biological enzyme is 100%, has shows 100% fidelity. So there are off-target effects with CRISPR. So if you're going to go in and start engineering human embryos and you're going to, with the aim of taking those embryos to term, then there's the real, the, the, regardless of the ethical issues, there's also the technical worries that you're actually introducing extra mutations that you don't know about. Yeah, but we're going fast forward. You know? yeah. Between yeah. 2000, in 2014, we, we thought, well, we have decades uh, to experiment with CRISPR. Yeah, in 2016, embryo experiments. So if yeah. we are going to see um, real experiments on human beings in 2025, we have no time. I mean, the scary so bit actually is that potentially we could do anything with that. So mm. the big question is how far we want to go. Yeah, to set the limits. That's the, the point of the ethics and the law. Where are the limits? Where are the boundaries? Will we stop with the genetically modifying for uh, uh, genetically editing for uh, therapeutic needs and to cure diseases, uh, single gene diseases? Or are we going to modify our babies? Yeah, well, I consider. think the single, the single gene thing, I think, is a bit of a red herring. I, I hope that's a word that's familiar. Um, it, it, so we already have, and we have had for decades, the ability to eradicate single gene genetic disorders, okay, um, just through pre-implantation diagnosis. So if you have in vitro fertilization because you, you have a history of genetic disease, okay, you can go to a clinic, you're you have an in vitro fertilization scenario to generate embryos which would be implanted. Um, but those embryos before they're implanted are tested. So a, yeah. a section, uh, usually a cell is removed and they're tested to see whether that embryo has the mutation or not. And if it doesn't have the mutation, then they'll be implanted. Well, we and already do some kind of selection. So anyway. it's already yeah. going on. And, and I don't th I think CRISPR is too expensive. Uh, uh, people talk about this a lot, but I, it seems to me that Pre-implantation genetic diagnosis is by far the best way to go for things like Huntington's and cystic fibrosis, single gene disorders. Whereas I think where CRISPR is possibly going to be used in the future is more complex. Right. Things. Now, can you, um, can you talk a little bit more uh, about um, the difference in applying this technology for somatic cells, meaning the localized uh, uh, cells that are not procreating? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm being the, the, the silly public here, so if I, you know... Uh, misdefine something, you know, correct me. Um, so can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, so, um, different cells? Yeah, so the difference between somatic cells and germline cells is pretty straightforward. Somatic cells are the things that only live for a generation and die, okay? Uh, the germline cells are the things which potentially are immortal, okay? So um, in, in the sense of the sperm and the egg. So um, Currently, there are international moratoriums which say you are not able to modify the, germ the human germline. And the reason for that is that the generations to come can't give their consent. 
Okay, so, so it's essentially the change that you make, it will be inherited by other inherited generations. Inherited and passed down, that's right. So you, you are not allowed, allowed to interfere with the germline in the sperm and the eggs. But there are somatic cell therapies currently already in, in the clinic, in trials. Right. So this is where, so for instance, the classic one is uh, people infected with HIV. You can remove uh, their white blood cells, modify their white blood cells. In some cases, that will be to remove all the copies of the HIV in the genome using CRISPR. Or to modify the genome of the cells so that HIV can't infect them. Right. And then put those cells, grow them so that you've got enough, and then put them back into the bodies of the patient. Yeah. Right. Uh, and this technology is already with us. Or just any type of virus, you know, making yeah. somatic cells of, of the cells of your body resistant to any virus you decide, or resistant to malaria. Right. right. Where well, Mr. Petit says that something that is very sensible topic for uh, laws and ethics, uh, the informed consent. So imagine a situation where uh, we have reach that stage where, where can we modify, for example, human body. And we can put something additional on it. Put muscles, put four legs, put four arms. <laughs> yeah. I don't know when this is going to happen or whether it's going to happen, but it is likely. It is likely. Yeah, but there uh, is certain certainty. Yeah. And I will give the, the following example. Sorry, I'm not sexist or cynical, but imagine a couple having a baby and uh, a baby girl and the mother says, let's put her big breasts. Yeah, that, that will ensure success in life. And <laughs> 20 years after, <laughs> that, that baby, <laughs> probably, that baby, uh, she's already 20 year old woman and she wants to become a teacher in primary school. Yeah? What's wrong with having... <laughs> well, yeah. in primary school, mostly the problem won't be with the kids, but with the parents. But right. uh, yeah, imagine that example in high school. Yeah. yeah. So she's telling her parents, what have you done? I'm not being taken care, I'm not being taken serious, and I will sue you. So, so the issue here is that nobody asked her, right? Yeah, of course. That's the idea of informed consent. Okay, but... Uh, yeah, yeah, but, okay, but, sorry, but, but to just yeah, to how far can you go in that direction? I mean, yeah. you were born blonde, and then you go to your mom and say, why the fuck did you get to this guy that was blonde? I never wanted to be blonde. You know? Exactly. You know, nobody I, asked me. I was going to say that nobody asked me if I want to inherit the magnificent boldness of my dad, but it happened. Yeah. <laughs> but it worked on you. Yeah, for example, yeah. on somebody else, it, it might not work. So you are not going to sue your father, but you don't know the next generation. Maybe right. your son is going to sue you mm -hmm. and to bring a claim <laughs> in, in, the, uh, in the court. So okay, yeah, we have to think about that, the genetic transfer. Uh, I didn't want that. Yeah, why did you do it? Yeah, but at the same time, uh, um, uh, there is no large difference between uh, what we said that we are all already uh, essentially doing in in, in 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 vitro fertilization. We can uh, we can you know remove some of the some of the traits that we think can be can be damaging. Now, from an ethical and 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 from a, um, um, uh, from a law uh, stand standpoint, you know. Don't we have a certain obligation to improve ourselves? Now, and I'm now <laughs> I'm touching here a very sensitive topic, but uh, the example with the breast was very nice, but um, <laughs> if we say that uh, if you give uh, a kid a gene, um, you know, for, for more healthy muscles, let's say, you know, uh, there is a correlation between, you know, muscle mass and general health. Uh, so why, why would that be something that we would want to regulate? Well, this is the question of how far. How far right. can we get? Where we should put the boundaries? Where will be the limits? Wh wh where, uh, which will be the diseases which are we, are we are going to cure? Yeah? And what w uh, are they going to be only therapeutic and uh, uh, disease curing issues? Or are we going to physically modify us? So right. where will be the limit? But again, right. I mean, the f we are essentially doing physical modification when we're when we choosing our partners. We probably don't do this intentionally. Yeah, but that's, th that's, th well. that's our consent. That comes from us. But not the consent of my us. son. Yeah. I mean, why not. did you choose mom? She's short, you know, and I'm short. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. <Where is> yeah. She? <laughs> She's somewhat there, by the way. <laughs> not sure where she is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, I mean, it's, it's becoming a bit conversation like this is Sparta. We throw away all the yeah, bad babies, well, you know. Like <laughs> well, no, but it, but but it, it is uh, uh, it is part of the of the general discussion out there. I mean, do we have the obligation to actually go into the direction in which we want to improve ourselves, you know, or 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 not, you know? Well, it can be a genetically Sparta, if you give a thought on that. Well, you know, you are pregnant with a child, and he's going to be short. 
and so on. And you say, no, I Take don't want short shot. But the, yeah. just make it long. Yeah, yeah. Make it tall, taller. Here it's going to be a basketball player. Add him to arms, please, so he can dribble with four balls. And put it in the yeah, game. You, you're actually and correct, especially when we're speaking about the, you know, aesthetic qualities. These are, um, uh, you know, they're fundamentally limited uh, within a certain time scale. You know, we can decide to create Rubenesque uh, children uh, because they will, it will be more beneficial in the you know, society will. that they live in, but they might end up themselves, you know, in a completely different culture. So, um, all right, uh, one of the, uh, uh, you know, besides, you know, genetic, uh, uh, genetic improvement of babies and, and, and modification, one of the topics that people love to speculate about is, uh, uh, is actually reviving um, already disappeared species, uh, as we're um, talking about T-Rexes here. So is, um, is Jurassic Park a, a plausible scenario? Theoretically, yes, we don't, we haven't made it yet, but I mean, we discussed this like two days ago. It's like evolution takes place in small steps, yeah, like most probably one step at a time, changing one letter in the DNA alphabet after one letter, all right, and it's being selected generation after generation. And then modern science, bioinformatics, systems, biology, they think that they could trace back those changes, you know, and go back to the original species from uh, where we originated from, basically. Okay, our ancestor, maybe our single ancestor, who knows? And so through CRISPR, theoretically, we could trace back all this path and we could, you know, recreate the past creatures, anything that... So that they can recreate the fish that we all came out of? Well, yeah, less, less, theoretically, less, less, yes. Theoretical. Experiment after experiment okay. after experiment, yeah. You could go back there and then you could restart evolution. And basically, you just, you know, avoid the net, you could avoid natural selection, make the selection in lab. All right, and then you could select for anything, and it's not going to be a GMO, by the way. So it is not. Ba basically, but, it's but not going to be regulated. But we are willing to against. stop that. We are willing to stop that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the problem. I mean, there's certainly the the, the stuff you're talking about. I mean, uh, Joseph Thornton's lab has done this at the level of single proteins. So they've they've gone back and they've reconstructed ancestral proteins millions of years um, and and sh looked at their properties. I, and I think you're right. Technically or in principle it's possible, but the issue then is, the, is how complex are those steps. Yeah. And the other thing we, we, is that many of those steps will be invisible to us today. Okay? Sure, they'll be, the remnants of them will be recorded in the genomes of modern organisms, but lots of them will have been eradicated. They won't, won't be there. So I think what we'll be doing is having to sort of work from scratch, as it were, to say, okay, well, can we, do, uh, we probably can't, Precisely, we certainly can't recover dinosaur DNA. That's never going to happen, okay? Um, Unless there is something alive out there right, in the right, jungle. Right, right, yes, not less monster <laughs> or something. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Um, uh, but um, the idea would be that you take something that is effectively a dinosaur, say like a chicken, because okay, that, that is effectively a dinosaur, yeah. and just work backwards and say, okay, well, what, do we, what tweaks can we make to, say, lose its feathers, have a teeth instead of beaks, get bigger. Um, some of those things we understand, a lot of them we really don't. Um, I, I work on a tiny, tiny worm, it's about a millimeter long, and it has only 959 cells. Okay? So it's a really simple system, and, and yet we, beyond a few, you know, we certainly couldn't make significant changes. We couldn't give it, say, five tails. We wouldn't know where to start. Right, so even a simple system like that, it shows the level of our ignorance. But didn't you tell me yesterday that they created chickens with teeth? There are, there are chickens with teeth, yes. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Um, people just looked at the genes. So yeah, imagine that. Yeah, uh, yeah. So they're, stuff they're still of nightmares. They don't survive, and that's actually another important thing. Yeah. So the, the chickens don't survive because as soon as you start making changes in one area, you think, oh, I'll change this gene and that will do that you don't realize that the ge genes only don't work in one set of cells or one tissue. They often work in lots at different times in life. So you might think, this is brilliant. This person's going to have, I don't know, um, big muscles. But they might have tiny kidneys or, uh, or even more catastrophic things than that. So, so it's really not that precise, is it? At least when we're speaking about the... Not at the um, moment. Yeah, the, the phenotypical expression of, of the genes that we are changing, we, we have no idea of the general effect that it can have on a complex uh, organism. And genes aren't units. We often talk about them as if they're beads on a string, and that's a, a useful metaphor, but it's, like most metaphors, it's inaccurate. The genomes 
unbelievably messy. Okay, uh, you have genes that sit inside other genes, sometimes with genes sitting inside those genes. Some genes uh, get switched on by a switch that lives on the other side of the room, okay, or a switch that lives in another gene, okay, and so you've modified that gene, and now you've modified the ability to switch this gene on. Um, coupled with that is that when you look at, say, the human genome, most of the human genome isn't important or it's not doing anything important for the organism. It's just so-called junk DNA. And most of the human genome is junk DNA. Only a small, maybe 10% at most, is doing something really important for us. Yeah, that's why we need law to say, <laughs> just, just, <laughs> just stop switching that switch that, that you're not, uh, that you don't know what are they for. Yeah. 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 So, so there is, to, to get back to my boldness, there is no gene for boldness. There is a yeah, there, there is, is, there is, there is, there is. Yeah. There is there Try is. modifying it. So we can cure that. that. That's potentially a possibility. Your problem is solved. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Give me a call. <laughs> Probably but the, but the question is, why is baldness there? So is it there just, is it randomly? Is it because a long time ago, women thought bald men were really cool and hot? Okay. <laughs> and maybe, and lots of women still do, right? Obviously, yeah. So <laughs> that would give it, <laughs> that would give it an evolutionary selection. Right. Or maybe something else was being selected for. Okay? Yeah. And that the, the gene is somehow connected to that other thing that was selected for. So you get rid of baldness, you get rid of the other thing. So we, we essentially don't have the full mapping of you know, how this whole thing works. Not even, not even close. close. Not even close. So it sounds to me like a self-regulating thing. I mean, it, it sounds like a showstopper for many things here. Yeah. yeah, but if it goes out the labs, we have a problem. So yeah. can it go out yeah. of the labs? I mean, is that a technology that can be widely available? I mean, can I do something? About that. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. speaking you're of big bold, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, speaking of CRISPR, it is known that it is it is fa fairly cheap, it is fast, mm. it is secure, for now, for now, and uh, there are many laboratories that can afford it. Uh, China is selling patents. For example, in the European Union, we still do not know um, is gene editing gene modification. Uh, in the Scandinavian countries, they say, okay, we have no laws in the EU for gene editing, so go, edit, go with <coughs> gene editing, and if the European Union sets some regulation, we will fulfill it. Uh, and in the United States, we have very harsh laws on uh, clinical testing, but uh, one, uh, once a uh, drug or an experiment goes uh, out uh, of the labs, it is not uh, anymore regulated. So we have dip different um, legislative approaches around the world, the world, but we are still not uh, quite known to the effects, for the future effects. Okay. And that's my point of view. Mm -hmm. So if we are going to regulate it, we have to know, are there going to be big le leaps? Are we going to take fast steps? Or are we going to move very slowly forward so that the law can cope with the science? Right. I heard that, uh, that there you can actually purchase from Amazon uh, a CRISPR kit to change uh, the brewer's ease that you make beer with okay. and to, you know, to play with it to create blue beer or something, something like that. Uh, is that the beginning of a nightmare? I mean, is that <laughs> uh, how cheap it's going to get and how fast it's going to get? You know? I mean, th these uh, are by far the only sorry, no. single cells that you could you know, get hands on at least. So basically to maintain a cellular culture from any type, you need a lot of lab resources, you need a lot of machines, you need a lot of effort, you need uh, labor. I mean, it's, it's not that simple. You need to maintain the single cells or, you know, st cellular culture, cultures with viral cultures inside them, which is even more expensive, mm. in order to be able to even think to try something. I mean, the only thing you could work with is yeast, are yeast, or some bacteria that live on your body or in your body. Right. Okay, but certainly a rogue state or um, um, with enough money, definitely. with enough money, can do that. Yeah, no, or or Elon Musk, who is yes, slowly exactly, going yeah. nuts yeah. Uh, yeah. at yeah. some point, can can do something like mm -hmm. that. All right, uh, le le let's cover the apocalyptic scenario, the thing that you that you touched uh, on, on as well. So we we create a genetically modified organism mm -hmm. and we somehow release it in the um, you know in the outdoors. Right. Uh, do we get the Planet of the Apes? I mean, what a, uh, how how would this do we have, like, w w will such an organism necessarily survive? Because we assume that if we make an ape smarter and release it in the jungle, 
uh, it will take over the world. You know? uh, I'm not sure about apes. Certainly, people have already started thinking about this. Well, since CRISPR appeared, people recognize that because CRISPR makes uh, changes in the genome, what you could do is make CRISPR make CRISPR. Okay? So you put CRISPR into a cell, and CRISPR copies itself into the, the genome of that cell. Um, and that's what's that's so, so called gene drive. And then people realize, oh, that's brilliant, because we could use that, say, for treating malaria. Okay? So there are two approaches, but one of the approaches has been to uh, make a CRISPR that goes in, copies itself, but as well as copying itself, it destroys one of the genes that the malaria parasite needs in the mosquito to survive. So what you do is you've made a machine, a little tiny molecular <coughs> machine, that can be transmitted across the mosquito population. <coughs> Every time it gets into a new mosquito, it copies itself, destroys the gene for malaria support, and then, then that mosquito mates with another mosquito, does the same thing, and keeps doing it and doing it. And so as the mosquitoes breed with each other, eventually you've got a population of mosquitoes which can no longer support malaria. All right, but let's go. Uh, but, but what about the plausibility of this scenario, considering that this mosquito, which was bred in a lab, you know, born in a lab, released within millions of mosquitoes who are extremely well adapted to the environment that they inhabit? Uh, so th this happened already. I mean, they did it to fight dengue. In, I think it was I'm sorry, to what? dengue, like one of the diseases that is spread through mosquitoes, okay. like in the tropical belt, whatever, like Singapore and stuff. I think it was paid by the Singapore state, something like that. So they released male mosquitoes that their progeny is just male mosquitoes. Yeah, it's not CRISPR exactly. Yeah. So it's yeah. only males? Yeah. So basically when they mate with, you know, with female mosquitoes, then all the progeny is only male. Yeah. The children are and only male. And you can male. create only females as well. Yeah, so basically they reduced, I think, by... 90-something percent of the population of this precise type of mosquitoes. The, the issue then is, well, first of all, you're releasing, you're consciously releasing what is effectively a self-replicating system into the, into the ecosystem. So and you have to know really well that that is not going to escape. Now, we know that um, insects in particular are parasitized by things like ticks, mites, and so forth, which feed upon them. And as they feed upon them, they often transfer, when they move to another host, they transfer that DNA when they go, okay? We, we, that's happened in Drosophila lab stocks, for instance. Um, so ticks that feed, or mites that feed on Drosophila can transfer uh, DNA from one Drosophila strain to another, okay? And we know that parts of, so e even the cow genome, parts of the cow genome originally come from reptiles and from snakes. And that, again, was a, a, a mite, or a tick in this case, that, that bites both reptiles and mammals and was able to transfer genes from the snakes. To the, the human blood type genes are considered foreign DNA elements. I mean, supposedly they came from viruses from something. <coughs> right, but, uh, okay, let's talk about ticks then. <coughs> you know, these horrible, horrible cre creatures. You know, so we have the problem of Lyme disease, uh -huh. right? Um, we do not want to eradicate ticks because we have no idea what impact that will have on the ecosystem in general. Because, as you said, you know that can you know, change the DNA of all the other organisms and you know affect uh, affect it in multiple ways. But can we change the behavior of ticks? As far as I know, uh, the, the the way they transfer Lyme disease is by first they bite some other animal, or and then if they bite okay. a human, they get contaminated. So can we make a genetic change, whereas the ticks don't like? to yeah. bite these original animals yeah. so we don't get Lyme disease. That's potentially possible. I mean, we, the, the organism I work on, we, we know that we can change its behavior. It, it happens to like certain salts. Um, it, likes, it, it actually likes the smell of popcorn, um, uh, um, diacetyl, and we can, we can modify its genes so that it no longer likes the smell of popcorn. It, obviously, that sounds incredibly useless, but... Yeah. <laughs> Trust me, it has, a, it has a purpose. So potentially we could do the same with ticks. The only thing I would worry about is that, yeah, okay, you put those ticks in, but probably they're not going to be able to compete then with... You'd have to do right. all sorts of weird yes, things. Yes, but can they mutate? I suppose they can. They will probably can. mutate back to... Yeah, yeah exactly. and uh, can they be become resistant to certain natural factors, for example? Yes, of course yeah, they. They will. Uh, can they start spreading other diseases? Of course. Yeah, so to quote these Jeff are Goldman, the main life finds a way. These are other issues, yeah. yeah. And you just said you're not showstoppers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
It's depressing. But we shall estimate it. We shall estimate the risks. And if the risks are greater than the benefits, this is what I started with, then we shall, we shall consider some sort of limitations. But that's the and thing, we can't estimate them, right? The yeah, of course. yeah, we, we, we cannot mean, at this point, but um, with the science moving fast forward, we can foresee them. Yeah, right. So foreseeing is the first step of prevention. And when they foresee them, we can certainly estimate them to a certain part, of course. That's the idea of protection. And what's going to happen afterwards? EU is going to abide with this law, maybe the US, Japan, maybe. No, no and probably some organism will step out of the lab and do some apocalyptic yeah, scenario. Yeah, no, of I course. mean, there are many countries that are, <laughs> they do not care about this type of regulation. And the one that does it first and does it properly probably will get a cutting edge and everyone else will try yeah. to follow suit. They, they like will make the universal soldier first and then we are all conquered and you know, uh, like. They'll okay. be like the Jean-Claude Van Damme's everywhere. I, I think we're a long <laughs> way from the universal soldier, though. Um, I, I think whoever does it first, if they do do it, um, will probably want to hide the results because I don't think it'll be pretty. Right. Yeah, for sure. I mean, Bulgaria has a long story in weird experiments, actually, in socialism. You know that we... Yeah. I mean, they were inbreeding... What between did we do? <laughs> yeah, like human and pig, and then... Yeah. You know human like and what? I'm sorry? And pig. Pig. Oh, come on. Yeah. Okay. And it was horrible. And then also tomato and potato with the idea that you get the above part of tomato and the below of the to potato. Then you got the above part of the potato and the below of the tomato. Is that the yeah. genetics of Lysenko? I mean, can, can you actually... <laughs> yeah. That's... So okay, it, it I think it's time to end. Okay, we we are closing the we are closing the uh, the end of this conversation. Thankfully, because the direction that we were going was <laughs> uh, was was kind of odd. Uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, I know it's a uh, um, you know, it's a huge topic, uh, and it's a uh, we we continue having uh, you know very um, interesting conversation. I will again encourage you uh, to uh, ask your questions uh, on slide.do. Uh, these fine gentlemen will be also part of the Q and A session. Uh, so they will be able to answer uh, to answer all your questions that you might have following this discussion. Uh, so I hope you I hope you enjoyed uh, our short talk and uh, yeah, thank you. That was it. Thank you.